Today I come to you with another informative video about buyouts. Before I do that, I just wanted to just like lightly comment on this lighting. It's very easy for me to change the lighting. I just like, you know, change it on the little wheel. The lighting is a mood. I feel like we all need to identify that. If you don't find this video informative, which would bum me out, I hope you do, you can at least mute me and just sit here in a bask of what could be a vampire den. We'll see, we'll see what happens with this. But if you see a bat, don't be surprised. Today I'm doing a video on four types of buyouts that I encounter in the ways that I approach your situation. Diving right in per usual. First one, proving cash flow. This is the main one. This is the most common one. This is the one I deal with often. You have a unit that maybe is below market, could use some rehabbing, and you want to buy out a tenant so that you can rehab the unit and get market rent. The pros of this is that you have upside on rent. So if you're able to do this, you can get higher market rent. There's a time horizon to get the money back. So when people do buyouts, this reason it's not like, well, like tomorrow I'm gonna like be a bajillionaire. No, you have to have the money set aside for the buyout and you have to have money set aside for the rehab. And then the difference in the market rent really dictates how long it's gonna take in your budget. The difference in market rent is, you know, $2,000. You might wanna have, you know, a little bit higher of a budget because you can probably recoup that money, you know, two and a half years. The difference is like a thousand bucks and the cost of all this is gonna be like 50 grand. That's gonna really affect either how much you can put into your rehab and how much you can do a buyout and if it's even feasible. So those are considerations that I talk to landlords about, which usually when landlords come to me, they already have done the numbers. And they go, this is my budget for the buyout because I have to spend this much money on the rehab. And you know, we work from there. My approach to this is very straightforward. This is what you know you wanna do. Don't sugarcoat it. And a lot of the times this is what's expected. And this is actually how you keep a lot of rent control properties in stock. Because what happens is the landlord pays a tenant to move out and then pays to rehab it. And a tenant comes in to a rehab unit. And that unit has probably had a lot of work done to upgrade it so that it you know, will improve and work better for the new tenant because that's what a new tenant's basically paying for, a nicer unit. So a lot of this is done in rent control properties because those are the properties that predominantly lend themselves to buyouts because they're rent controlled. And this is what kind, in my opinion, keeps rent control properties in stock because if a landlord is allowed to rehab them and then get market rent, they're less inclined to sell the property to a developer or to a huge corporation and they're more likely to keep it and it's gonna stay rent controlled because the properties that are rent controlled under the typical rent control stay rent controlled and pretty much till the day they're demolished. So that keeps a lot of those properties in stock. A lot of rental properties um, that are rent controlled come out of the stock because they usually get demolished because they get redeveloped. And the reason why they get demolished is that someone likely sold it because they weren't making enough money on it. And so I like to think that this is like a cycle, like, you know, you, you pay a tenant to move out so they have money to move. Um, that tenant's likely gonna move to a nicer unit, maybe a brand new unit, or maybe another rent controlled unit that has been remodeled. Um, you get to remodel your unit, you get market rent, and then you keep it going. And that's kind of the life cycle of rent control properties. And I'm a proponent of it because again, you get to keep these properties, they stay rent controlled, and a lot of them have really cool architecture that I can appreciate. So that's kind of the upside to that and the approach to that. And it is a cycle. And you know, if landlords, you have to reward, you know, the ambition or the effort. So landlords, you know, in order for them to make improvements, they have to have the money to improve it. And if they're collecting far below market rent, they're not gonna have the money to improve it. That's basic economics. And so if they have the money set aside for their buyout, and the rehab, that's great, because actually not a lot of landlords have a lot of money set aside for buyouts in the first place or rehabs. And a lot of the units are habitable, but maybe they're out of date. And so this is a way to keep, again, I keep repeating it, to keep the housing stock going. Another one that is very common is if landlords wanna sell a property. Properties, I find typically five units or less. The If they have no vacancies, they're worth a lot less. So uh, smaller par like properties, especially like houses, for instance, they're worth more if they're vacant. So a lot of the times 
landlords want a vacancy, they want a house vacant if they're gonna sell it, or they want you know one or two vacancies in a multifamily property, because that's gonna make the property more valuable. And the reason being is, when someone comes to buy these properties, they come to buy it because they're gonna owner occupy it. And so someone who buys and wants to owner occupy, they don't wanna deal with giving the notice to the tenant, moving the tenant out, they wanna be able to move into a unit. And so if you have a vacant unit, it makes it that much more appealing to a buyer. And specifically, if you have, like, let's say, a multifamily, you want to have, you know, the largest unit vacated because that's likely the one that an owner is going to want to move into. So that helps. I've seen, you know, a vacancy add upwards of $100,000 or more in LA to the value of a property, like a smaller property, because it's vacant. Vacancies are not super helpful if you have like a large apartment building. They are appreciated, but having too many vacancies becomes a problem. But with smaller buildings, the vacancies actually help and the landlords um, like it because then they can choose who they're, who's gonna move in. Maybe they can move in more family of their own. So it gives them a lot more flexibility when they're gonna buy it. A lot of times banks might require there be at least a vacancy if someone's buying it to own or occupy, the bank might require that. So again, it, it, you have a larger buying pool if you have vacancies in a smaller um, property with like five or less units. Now, another way that, you know, or another reason why I do buyouts is delinquent tenants. So delinquent tenants are ones that they have um, either a rent debt that they haven't paid off, so they owe you money, or they've committed some sort of lease violation, they're on notice of it, and you're contemplating enforcing the lease and doing an eviction. The most common one is though, tenants haven't paid rent. So when tenants haven't paid rent, a lot of the times you can do a buyout and you would offset some sort of number like, you know, the buy will be this amount, but I'm gonna offset this rent so you'll get this amount. And you avoid, this helps landlords and tenants both because the tenant avoids having to go through the eviction process and having their rent or their, their credit possibly dinged from an eviction and gives them a clean slate. And oftentimes the rent debt gets offset. So even though they owe money, they might still possibly get money for moving out, which that money they'll use as a security deposit and moving funds to go somewhere else. Probably somewhere else is a little bit more affordable. I've seen a lot of tenants move to different areas that are more affordable or even closer to different family, um, which helps them because then they can pay that rent much easier than maybe the current rent that they're delinquent on. Um, another thing is it avoids the eviction process. So it, it mitigates the further loss of rent that the owner is going to have to deal with. If the tenant's already not paying rent, then you can probably get them to agree to move out in a quicker time period and save having to go through court where you potentially can't collect rent going forward. So that's another popular one. And then the last one is a mismatched fit. So this is in part nuisance um, and in part like a tenant that's super unhappy. I've seen several times tenants move into a, you know a property and then for some reason they hate it i don't know why but they like immediately want to get out of their lease they want to break their lease so like a, a, you, you do somewhat a buyout like this in this sense it's kind of like a settlement or more so a settlement where you it becomes a lease you know termination to negotiate out the break the lease break Another one is you might have a tenant that's like a nuisance, either a nuisance to you or maybe other tenants, maybe they violated the lease a lot, things like that. That you, you know, in lieu of an eviction, you might pay the tenant to move out and say, hey, it's not working or it's not fit, or you know, maybe you need more space, or you know, maybe it's better if you go somewhere else and you pay them to move out. So that's, you know, a way where it's more amicable than being like, I'm evicting you you're giving the tenant the means to move out. Um, or, you know, if the tenant like really, really hate, I mean, we've had it where like tenants, like maybe they've lived somewhere a long time and they hate it. To kind of nip it in the butt, you can go, hey, like we can do some sort of lease termination agreement. And they agree to move out and that, you know, would mitigate any of the things going forward that they can complain about. So just people like that are unhappy or that are just causing problems, there's the age old saying, you know, just throw money at it. <laughs> Not that you have to throw a lot, but sometimes it's just like, hey, you're paying for your peace of mind as a landlord in this case, and also for the tenant. So those are the four most common ones. The approaches to them, you know, are pretty much all the same. If a tenant 
and you don't see eye to eye, the tenant most definitely knows that you both don't see eye to eye. If you have, you know, if you're selling a property, the tenants know what's going on. Um, if you want, if you have under market rent, tenants know. If tenants are delinquent, they obviously know. A lot of the times tenants understand what's going on and, and they get it. Not all the tenants agree, but a lot of the tenants get it. So they're, they're not trying to necessarily thwart it. They just might want to get a good deal. And really that depends on your budget. Um, and not every deal is possible, but in the words of Wayne Gretzky, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So sometimes it's just a matter of starting the conversation. But those are very common buyouts and a lot of them get done. For some reason, people are a little taboo about them. Not sure why they're voluntary agreements. But those are, if you have any one of those scenarios, you might want to contemplate doing a buyout and having a you know preliminary discussion with an attorney about it, who does it. Um, so that way you can, you know, get an idea of what you're facing and what your options are and, and what, you know, possible backup plans you may have in the event that, you know, maybe you can't do a buyout, but maybe you have some other recourse. So I hope that you found this video helpful. I will link at the end. I have a playlist on buyouts specifically, so you can watch those videos. Um, if you liked this video in general and you felt it helpful, you might want to check out my newsletter. Every week I post or I send out a newsletter that's, you know, for landlords. It has news and it has a lot of helpful information about it. So you might want to check that out. Sign up. It's free. The link should be below. Other than that, thank you for stopping by and I will see you in the next one.